I love teaching the Word of God. In fact, I love the Word of God. I think I told you the first time that I love it enough that I'm willing to die for it. I'm willing to go to prison for it. And I'm not willing to compromise. This is my life. This is everything. And I'm not just passionate about it, but I'm absolutely in love with the Word and with the God that is that Word. So we've started talking, and we talked about God and this relationship and this expectation that he has for each and every one of us. And he has a plan. It's, it's universal, and yet it is unique to each individual. And we each have a certain place and a certain position. And God knows exactly. He formed us, and he didn't just form us randomly, but he put together certain traits and certain talents and certain abilities. And we talked last week a little bit about that. But he did it for a purpose. And then he brings all of us together. And as those of us in point of mercy, he's brought each of us together for a unique plan that in this last time, we are going to be an overcoming church that is going to take on a lot of challenges in this world. We really are. So we started talking. Then we talked about that new birth experience. Repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, and finding that there can be what Jesus said was a new birth. You've got to be born of the water, and you've got to be born of the Spirit. And if you have experienced it, it is the most amazing and the most wonderful thing that could ever happen to you. kind of reminds me, we've got Pierce and Noah, and we've got Zoe here today, and when you hold a newborn baby, to me it's like I'm just... I'm just seeing the face of God, and, and I know that God is a mighty creator because to form something that perfect and that amazing, I mean, I, I, every time I'm in awe, I really am. It's so small, and yet it's so perfect and so complete. How do you do that, God? Only God can do that, you know? And that's the same way it is with the new birth experience of salvation. It, it's just that amazing, and it's that powerful. And I believe we're going to see many people here because we believe it, because God is going to bless that we're going to see many people receive his spirit they're going to know that same amazing experience that we've had so God's good and then after that we kind of talked about how that after we're born there has to be some time where we're really going to that newborn baby's going to take some food and I actually skipped the lesson on the word of God and I don't know why but we can always wrap back up onto it and I thought about doing it this week and somehow or another it didn't work that way either but studying the word of God, because that's really, this is the primary, I told you I love this word. And so when we get to that lesson, I probably can't shut it down. There's a lot of these lessons that I can probably go 10 lessons and never get anywhere on. But the word of God is definitely one of those. But we grow by the word of God. We have to understand that this is our life. And not only do we study it, but if we memorize it, if we meditate on it, if we apply it, then it becomes so much of a blessing to each and every one of us. And then there's also prayer. And prayer is this amazing experience that we connect to God and God connects to us. And it's the most amazing experience that we could ever have. And then just to help us accent that, we talked about fasting and how the, it seems like it's such a challenge for the flesh but yet when we do it we realize and we reap the benefits in the spirit because we actually have going on within us a war between the flesh and within the spirit and so we want to make sure that the spirit stays strong and then last week we talked about giving we talked about giving of finances but we really talked about giving of your life giving of your time and your talents and your abilities and making sure that all of our life is committed to god and with all of that, we really are positioning ourselves to where it's, it's a relationship with God. And now for the next few weeks, we're going to shift a little bit because not only is this supposed to be a relationship with God, they came to Jesus and they asked him what the two greatest commandments were, or they asked him what the greatest commandment was. And he said, well, the first commandment is, thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we talked about that the very first week. But then he went on and he said, and the second commandment is likened to it. And that is, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So really what he's saying is these two are equally important. So we're going to have a relationship with God, but we also have a relationship with others as well. And so really understanding how all that relationship works is vital, and we need to, we're going to start just putting our toe in the water of it this week, if that's okay. Anybody ever go swimming and you want to test the waters just to see what the temperature is? And we're going to test it a little bit today as far as just reaching out in some of those areas as well. And I've taught this 
particular series for many years and just starting to get ready for it today, I, I, I just had to pause and I was just over here praying. And Brother Blake, you, you had that song about, you know, facing a mountain. And it's like I was saying, God, times have changed and our world has changed. And what I taught then, now I almost have to teach it differently just because there's some things that have changed in our society. We're going to talk today. Well, first of all, let me just say everyone has an opinion about what a Christian is. You, you notice that? They all want to tell you what a Christian should be and what a Christian should say and what a Christian should think and how we should act. You know, they, they, they don't go to church. They don't read the Bible. But they're going to tell you what you need to do and how you need to act. Isn't that amazing? Like I said, I really love this word, and I think this word is really the answer. So we're going to build everything that we base our hope on on this word. Okay? But they're going to try to define a Christian as someone who's kind. Well, that's Okay. They're going to say that we need to be loving. Well, I'm, I'm 100% with them on that. Then they're going to say we need to be non-judgmental and accepting and tolerant. And almost to the point that they want us to be like a doormat. And just accept anything that anyone says. And if somebody wants to say something that's contrary to the word of God, well, we're just supposed to accept that. And we're supposed to be tolerant. That's where our society really is going. So I want to talk to you for a few minutes about some of these words. Tolerance. Definition is it's a fair objective. It's a permissive attitude toward those whose opinions, practices, or religions are different from our own. So what they want to say is I, I need to permit someone else to just do whatever and coexist equally with me. You know, to a degree, I can almost agree with that. We live in America, and that's part of freedom of religion, right? Now, of course, the flip side of that is they don't necessarily want me to be able to express my religion and to be able to share that with anyone else, but that's okay because what they don't want to stop there. They really want acceptance, acceptance of their beliefs. And acceptance is a fair, uh, no, acceptance is a person's assent to the reality of a situation. Just accept the situation. But it goes on to say, recognizing a process or condition, often a, neg a negative or uncomfortable situation, without attempting to change it, protest against it, or cause there to be any change related to it. If someone is living in sin, I'm sorry, but I cannot stand by and tell them that it's acceptable. And I cannot accept it. And I cannot tell them I have to protest if it's contrary to the word of God. And I, as I said, I'm willing to go to prison for this. I'm willing to die for this. And so I, I'm pretty, pretty adamant about where I stand on this. But we live in a society that really, w the elders, you understand what I'm talking about, but we have some young people in school, that, and you may have heard this for so long, it's almost, it, it, it becomes almost like this is the way I'm supposed to think because it's been ingrained in you and it's been indoctrinated into you. And they really want to. So what I'm doing today is I'm trying to teach something that is going entirely contrary to what we really are experiencing in our society. But it's entirely in line with the Word of God. And if it's in line with the Word of God, we're going to have to teach it. So this is going to be a little bit hard at first. We're going to get into some fun stuff, I hope. We'll see how that goes. But sometimes we just have to make sure this is a firm foundation. And when the rest of the world is, is on sinking sand, we still need to make sure that we're on that firm foundation of the Word of God. You're with me tonight? Yeah. All right. So th after they want you to be tolerant and acceptance, the next thing they want you to do is become an ally. Anybody notice that? They want you to become an ally. An ally is one who is associated with another to help them in their agenda. Well, I'll tell you what, if your agenda is sin, I, I can never be a, an ally with you because God is never going to be an ally with you. And I want to be lined up with him. How about you? All right. So enough on that. I want to talk to you tonight about the church, that we have to reach the lost. And we have to realize that the way we're going to do that is by being the salt of the earth. And we have to be different. And we have to stand on truth. Is that all right? So sometimes we're going to go against things that the rest of society is saying. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, Isaiah gave a warning to our generation. I believe it is very specific to our generation. He said, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That's happening today. goes on to say they put darkness for light and light for darkness. He is saying every major difference that you can say there's going to be that, and they're going to call dark light, and they're going to call light day. Now, if somebody wants to call daylight night and night day, most of us are going to think they're crazy. But what he's saying is as far as the beliefs and the value systems, that's exactly how extreme this world is going to become. And we're seeing that. We really are. They're going to put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. 
So maybe as never before, this generation of Christians is going to have to stand for truth. And so my challenge to you is do you love him enough really to make that stand? And do you know exactly what's in this word enough to really understand what's here? Because if you don't understand what's here, then you're going to have to accept everything that they say as truth. And let me just cover this as well. Truth is, anymore they say that truth is relative. Your truth is the same as my truth, and we all can have a different opinion of truth. Let me tell you the only real truth in my opinion, but it's more than my opinion. It's the actual establishment of the word of God. This is the only thing that's truth. This is absolute truth, and nothing else that is opposed to it is truth. So we're going to build tonight on the Word of God, and I love you, and it seem, if it seems like I'm coming on strong, well, I'll try not to go that way too, mar- too much. But what are the distinguishing marks of a Christian? I already said that everyone wants to tell us what a Christian is, but what is a Christian? How do you know if you're a Christian? What does this Word say a Christian is going to look like? What did Jesus say a Christian is going to look like? It's important, right? I already said I'm going to reject everything else as truth, so we better find an answer in here. Is that all right? Let's go to our key verse, Matthew chapter 7. We were in Matthew chapter 6 the last few weeks. That was all on the Sermon on the Mount. And this is the wrapping up of the Sermon on the Mount, actually in Matthew chapter 7. But verse 16 says, you shall know them by their fruits. Jesus said you're going to know a Christian by their fruits. Okay, do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Well, I was just last week, I was starting to look at landscaping things related to the church. I went to Walmart, and there was a section that had trees and went over there, and they had pear trees and peach trees and uh, apple trees. And, you know, there, I could tell there was a little bit of difference in each one. All they were was like, you know, saplings that you would plant. But I noticed that Walmart was very careful to make sure they had a, a tag on each one of them. So that you wouldn't accidentally think that you were going to get a pear tree and you ended up with an apple tree. You know, they wanted to make sure that you knew which one you got. Because it does make a difference because the fruit is going to depend upon the tree. And so Jesus is using this same example which we should be be able to understand. But really what he's talking about is us as Christians. Okay, so even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. Those are the types of trees I want, and that's the type of fruit I want, and that's the type of fruit that I want to be. But a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. So now he's he's saying evil, so now he's starting to shift from just talking about a tree to really talking about you and I, or mankind in general. He says a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. You can't do both. It doesn't happen in nature, and it doesn't happen in human nature either. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I believe that what he's really saying is that this is a heaven or hell issue. And there's going to come a time in judgment. And if, you, if we don't have the fruit of the Spirit within our life, then we're not going to be a part of his bride. I believe it, it, it's that serious that we need to take this. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Jesus spoke similarly in John chapter 15, verses 1 through 6, where he said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Where Jesus is saying, the man Christ Jesus is saying, I'm the one that you're going to connect to. I'm the vine. And God, the father, who is resonant within me, is going to be the farmer that's going to decide what this crop is really all about. He goes on to say, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he... God is going to take away. If we don't have fruit, God's going to take us away, is really what this is saying. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, and that it may bring forth more fruit. This ties into our song. You think that everything is going good, and all of a sudden you're doing everything that you can, and there's even fruit in your life, and all of a sudden you start getting all this pressure, and all these things start changing, and you're saying, what's going on? God, you're saying there needs to be more fruit. And he's really perfecting us. And so we'll talk about some of that fruit later on as well. He said, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. God is purging us. He's creating us. with, And his word is allowing us to have that cleansing. Because without the cleansing, then we can't have any fruit. We talked about repentance is necessary before you can receive that spirit. There has to be that cleansing and that taking out. And he's saying, now you're clean through my word so that there can be the implanting of my word which is going to produce fruit within you. He said, abide in me and I in you. Many people want the spirit to abide within them. 
But the first thing that Jesus said was we need to abide in him. That means that I need to live in him. That means when I wake up in the morning, the first thing that I need to do is I need to be thinking about Jesus Christ because I'm living in him, and my life now is his life. And when the last thing before I go to bed is I'm thinking about God. And everything in between and everything that I do in my life is I'm abiding in him. If I want his spirit to abide in me, then I have to abide in him. And many people forget that that's really what it's all about is abiding in him. Every breath that I take, I'm abiding in him. I'm living in him. Okay? As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. I can't have any fruit unless I'm really committed to that degree and that level of loving God and living for God. No more can ye except ye abide in me. He's saying you can't have any fruit unless you're really that committed to Jesus Christ. If a man abide not in me, I'm sorry, did I miss part or we go to the next one? Yeah, okay. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch. Again, this is the similarity to what he talked about before. There's some dead branches up, up on that hill by those trees that I, I walk past and I pick them up all the time and put them in a pile. They're not going to bring forth any fruit. There's not going to be any leaf. There's nothing that's going to happen to them. Men are just going to gather them and pile them together, and eventually we're going to have a bonfire. And that's what he goes on to say, if a man abide not in me. He didn't say if my spirit is not in them, but he said if, if you don't abide in me, then all that man is going to do is he's just going to be cast forth as a branch, and he's going to wither, he's going to die, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. So I believe that we're talking about something that's vital and something that's important and something that is critical to all that we're talking about. And just like a tree can be identified by its fruit, we can be identified as Christians by how we live. And we should be able to be identified as Christians by how we live. Jesus said we're going to have power to be a witness. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me. A witness is someone that is able to tell someone else about what they've seen and what they've experienced. There's that experience that I want to be able to share with someone else. And that part of that is if I'm going to be a, a believable witness, then I have to have something that demonstrates that what I have is real and genuine. And the only real evidence that I have is that abiding presence of God within me that I can then share with someone else as his spirit and the fruit of that spirit is evident within my life and within your life so we're talking about the fruit of the spirit and the importance of having the fruit of the spirit within us the fruit is determined by the type of the tree that's the same within us the fruit of our lives is determined by the source of influence upon our lives the things that influence us are the things that's going to produce the fruit within our lives the tree of the flesh brings forth a lot of evil fruit. It really does. And our old nature without Christ is incapable of producing good character. We just can't do it. We can try to a certain extent. Man can be good for so long, but after a certain point, there's going to be some evil that just comes out. Because that evil tree can never produce good fruit. You can try for a while. You can, you can make it look like it. You can, you can stack it around the tree. But at the end, there's going to be something that's rotten that's going to come out. And we all know that. That's what happens with us. That's why we have to abide in him. If I don't abide in him, I, I, you don't want to know me and you don't want me around you. The only good is if I can abide in him and his spirit will abide in me. And then this goodness of God can come out. And it's the same for each and every one of us. That's really what we're talking about. So the tree of flesh is going to bring out some evil fruit. But instead of, okay, instead of the... So Galatians chapter 5 verse 19... Y'all know that I'm getting to Galatians chapter 5, right? Verse 22 is going to talk about the, the works or the fruit of the Spirit. But before we ever get there, the Apostle Paul is saying there's some things that you need to understand that you can't have these in your life if you're going to have the fruit of the Spirit in your life. If we really want the fruit of the Spirit, we have to make sure that there's some things that are not in our life. So I want to cover some of those quickly. And this is why I had that introduction about times has changed and it matters about truth. Because a lot of the things that, are, that we're going to cover, society today is going to say it's okay or just accept it or it doesn't matter. I'm sorry, but it does matter. So this is a Bible study, but if I seem a little intense, then I'm just a little intense. So let's read these for just a few minutes. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. They're revealed. They're obvious. It doesn't take too long before you're going to see some of the bad in somebody, right? You know, they can, they can hide it up cover it up pretty well for a little bit but eventually you're going to say yeah there's something there and it's not quite like it should be and then he starts to list some of these works of the flesh that are manifest and we look at these things and and if these are in our life we're not going to heaven and the first four it seems like well these are all related to sexual impurity they really are it's adultery it's cheating when you're when you when you're married 
Is that a part of our society? Are you supposed to accept that if somebody does that anymore? Honestly, if people shack up, that's fornication. Is, is that supposed to be acceptable in our society? Yes. But we need to let somebody know, I want you to go to heaven, and I love you enough to tell you the truth and to do it with love. But at the same time, we, we can't say that that's okay. And w one thing I don't want is for us, because what happens is, first of all, you accept it, and then you become an ally. And after you become an ally, then you become a part of it. And there are churches today, and I did put the quotation marks on there for a reason, that are, are allowing these things to take place within the church. But it's not the church of God. And the most important thing isn't that we have a large number. The most important thing is that we get to go to heaven. All right. So adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, that's all related to the impurity of the flesh. And we don't want that in our lives and we don't want that in our church. And we want to help others to understand that these things are going to cause problems in your life. Ad adultery is going to cause a loss of a marriage. And it's not just going to affect you, but it's going to affect your children. It's going to affect generations. And it's going to affect so many people because for that moment of selfishness, there's going to be something that is going to be sin always results in in death, it always is, results in hurt, it always results in heartache, and so that sin is something that we want to make sure that we understand that there's a wage and there's an, a, a cost for that sin, and we don't want that sin. We want to be pure, we want to be acceptable to God, but the amazing thing is if, if we've sinned, we have an advocate with the Father, and all we have to do is go to him and repent, and we can find that restoration, and we can find that right relationship, which is really what it's all about, and he doesn't condemn us. And he never condemns us. And so when we are talking with someone else, yes, we're saying, no, that, that, that's not really the way you, you should live. But at the same time, we, we can offer them a better way. And we are not going to condemn them either. We're just going to lead them to the truth and say there's a better way and there's a better God. And, and so we, we offer this as, as a hope of salvation and as a joy of salvation. Yes, these are things that we're going to talk about, them, and we don't want them in our lives, and we don't want them in our families. We want to make sure that it's not there. But Jesus always hated sin but he always loved the sinner. And not only that, but he always had an opportunity for that sinner to repent and for that sinner to find a place of restoration. And we are now the body of Christ. So that's our purpose is, one, we have to be pure, but, two, we have to reach out. We have to understand and preach that same message that he taught. Sin is sin, and sin will not get you to heaven, but there is a God that loves you, and if you repent, there's hope and there's salvation. And so that's really what it's all about. So let's cover a few more of these sins which is really what this is. This is a list of sins, if we want to call it that. Next verse says, what is it? Idolatry. Now, there's no such, no one's sitting and, and worshiping Baal today, right? But everybody is, idolatry is anything that you put before God. And idolatry is very large in our society today. Very large in our society. Witchcraft. Uh, that's just a small minority of people that practice witchcraft, right? Does anybody know what the Greek word that was, it was actually in the original Bible for witchcraft is? Pharmacopoeia. Pharmacopoeia. What does that sound like? Well, we got a pharmacist and a couple of pharmacy students, so some of you should begin to understand what we're looking at with pharmacopoeia, right? And do we have a drug epidemic in our, pro in our society today? Witchcraft is prevalent within our society. It's that as far as it's drugs, it's, it's a relationship, it's, it's drugs, it's spells, it's enchantments. It's causing people to believe that they can find a release and an escape in something else other than God. Witchcraft is prevalent in our society today. Now, I, I know that there's also the, the wiki and all that, that, and that is also becoming more prevalent. But we need to understand that there's a larger aspect that we're dealing with today as well. Hatred, my Lord. Anybody find somebody, somebody just can't get, uh, they're, they're angry all the time? It's, we, we live in a world of hatred, and it's gotten worse in the last few year, years. Variance. What is variance? It's selfish ambition. It's, everything has to be my way. Do we have variance going on in our society? Should it be in a Christian's heart? No, it should be about the kingdom of God, right? About reaching others and loving others. So variance is something that shouldn't be in our hearts. What about emulations? Emulations is really just jealousy. Anybody worried about what somebody else has and what somebody else is doing in our society? It's crazy, isn't it? This, we're talking about today. We're talking about today. Emulations, wrath. Man, that wrath is, it's that fits of uncontrollable rage. Does anybody know what I'm talking about when we talk about wrath? Is that a part of our society today? 
fits of uncontrollable wrath. Don't put any names with it, and if you do, don't say them out loud. But I think we all know what we're talking about with wrath. And then there's strife, and that's just those people, every time you meet them, they always have to argue. And it doesn't matter if they're right or wrong. They'll argue that, that the, the, the sun is shining when it's midnight. But that's that contentiousness that, that comes with that, right? That strife. And then there's seditions. Seditions is resistance to authority. And most of the time, it's tied into a godly authority. We want to make sure that we are not resisting anything that God has placed as far as we should be a people that can be law-abiding, obedient, loving God, and loving others. And that should be what's in our heart, not seditions. Heresies are, are, is false teachings, and if there's ever a time when you can't, you, anybody want to trust the news? Tell me which news station you want to trust. Anybody, anybody really want to trust educators? There's questions with everything, Right? Because of heresies that are going on. And we want to make sure, that's why I said when I started this, this is the only thing that I want to build everything that I'm teaching on, everything that I'm living on. This I know is true. This is what I'm staking all of my life on. And I'm glad that I can have a firm foundation in the word of God. Continuing on, what's the next verse? We got one more verse related to these items. Envyings. Oh my goodness, this is a big one, isn't it? Envyings. Anybody know anybody that's related to the, everything that they see they want? And anything that someone else, they, they, it's just not good enough. We live in a world full of envy, don't we? I don't even know where I got my notes here. Uh, murders. I shouldn't even have had to go to notes for that one, right? But I think we all see a lot of that, don't we? Whether it's shootings or whether it's, it's just, we live in a rough world. And with this list that I'm talking about, it's talking about today. It's talking about today if ever we was teaching about anything. Drunkenness intoxication do we have a problem with drunkenness in our world revelings which is just that carousing the worldly parties and the entertainment and such like and the list just goes on is what he's saying and that list is going on today and you know when I, when I see that and when I think about that there's something in me that my heart just breaks because all these people and everything that they're really looking for they can find if they can just find Jesus Christ and if we can just let them know that we have the real answer and that we have the difference maker and that we have the one that gives love and joy and peace and all the goodness of this life so that's what we really want to talk about tonight is the fruit of the spirit before we yeah let's do we're going to skip some of those verses brother jeff if that's okay so we're going to talk about the tree of the spirit that brings forth a variety of good fruit the lord jesus christ himself said in no, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, if you'll pull that up, we're going to read verses 16 and 17. And it's, I probably flipped you through a whole bunch, didn't I? Well, basically it says the Lord Jesus Christ himself is going to establish you in every good word and work. Okay? So what we want to look at is how we are established in good words and good works. If I'm going to have fruit, then it's going to be something that someone else can see, and it's going to be something that can be examined in someone else, right? So it's going to be through the good word and the good works that I do. What are good words? Just picking something that edifies somebody else. My mom used to have a saying. I know some of those old timers had some good sayings, and when I was 19, I didn't think too much of it, and I might have made fun of it. But mom said, if you don't have anything good to say about somebody, anybody ever hear this saying before? Don't say any. You know what, if I would have listened to mom a few times, I would have saved myself from a whole lot of trouble. Yeah, sometimes mom's a lot smarter than you give her credit for. But not only that, but there should be something within the heart of every Christian that says, what I want to do is I want to build up someone, and I want to encourage someone. And when someone's down, I want to be the one that can go in there and speak a word that's positive and that's encouraging and that, that makes a difference in their life. I want to make a difference in the life of those around me because I want to love them and I want the Spirit of God to work through me. And part of that is what I say. It's important what we say. James chapter 3, verse 2 says, For in many things we offend all. He says, Nobody's perfect. Good enough. We agree with that, right? If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. If you can just keep that tongue under control, you're doing pretty good. And one of the best ways that I've found to keep the tongue under control is what mom said. Don't say something bad about somebody and try to find something good to say about somebody. And if we really start practicing this, you'd be amazed at how much we can edify and uplift one another and be a blessing one to another. Titus chapter 3 verse 2 says, To speak evil of no man. 
I guess that's maybe where mom got that, right? Speak evil of no man, to not be a brawler or a fighter, to be gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. So as far as words, let's speak the good, let's speak the edifying, let's uplift one another. Because why are we doing this? Because there's the Spirit of God, and there's a world that needs this. And they're not going to find it anywhere else. They need to find it from you and me. We're the church. We're the representation of Jesus Christ to this world. We're the representation to our family, to our friends, to our community. Let's make that difference that only we can do by what we speak. And not only what we speak, but what we do. Good, good works. The things that we do that build up or encourage one another. Titus chapter 3 verse 8 says, This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly. I want you to make sure that you're doing this all the time constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works brother Isaac you always go around and you're helping people out and you're doing good works this is exactly what this verse is all about what you're doing is you're saying the love of God is coming out through me and I'm going to make a difference in your life and I'm going to impact you in a positive way by being able to go and be there and be a blessing for you. He came in here on cleaning day and he was wiping down all the walls and tearing this whole place up and we, everybody that was here got encouraged by Brother Ike coming in here and doing all that, right? It was amazing. And that is exactly what each of us need to say. I want to constantly affirm that I'm going to be one that can maintain those good works. By the way, I was encouraged by every single person that came in here. We had an amazing turnout. We all worked hard and had a great time. So thank you. At least I had a good time. But, you know, my idea of fun is different, as my daughter can attest. So I do like, I like to stay busy, and I kind of enjoy work. He says, these things are good and profitable unto man. I found that there's a lot of good and a lot of joy out of just staying busy and helping other people. Anybody else ever find that to be true? And so we give, but really we get, and it's such a blessing to be a part of that. And that's exactly what we're talking about, about as far as if we're going to have the fruit of the Spirit within my life, it's going to be good words and it's going to be good works. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 says, and let us not be weary in well-doing. Anybody ever get tired of work? <laughs> and you ever, you ever get tired because you feel like it's just not doing any good? And many times, even when we're doing things that are related to the word of God, we can still get discouraged in it. And Paul is saying, don't be weary in well-doing. But he goes on to say, in due season, we're going to reap. It may be the middle of July, and you're still out there working in the fields. But, you know, there's going to come a time, and it may be a little bit further down the road, but we're going to reap, and we're going to enjoy that if we faint not. Goes on in the next verse to, to say, as we have therefore opportunity, every chance that you get is what he's saying. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. And by the way, there's a special group I want you to really pay attention to, but especially unto them who are the household of faith, especially the other church members. If you can pour out a blessing on a church member, go ahead and do it. Why? Because they're trying to get to heaven, and that means they have some extra opposition coming against them. And so let's make sure that we bind together so that we are encouraging one another. We're working with one another. You know what? You'll see the greatest blessings when you do that. I remember working with Bible quizzing, and anybody here know about Bible quizzing? You spend long hours, and you work with these kids, and you... you you actually have them memorize verses, and then you have them quote those verses to you, and you do it day after day after day after day. And then you take them to tournaments, and they're brats, and they run around, and, and they may or may not answer the questions. And No, we love Bible quizzing, and we had a lot of fun with it. And uh, I gave you the probably not the best presentation of what Bible quizzing is all about, but we did it for many years, and we worked with all of our kids. All of our kids probably had at least six or seven years of Bible quizzing. My oldest daughter had 13 years. So we've been heavily involved with it, but we didn't just do it with our kids. We actually coached uh, several teams, and so we would work se with several teams at one time, and I would get off work at 3, 3.30, and I'd run around the neighborhood and collect all the kids as they got out of school. My daughter would be riding with me, and we'd take them all to church, and we'd sit and we'd memorize verses, and we'd listen to them quote, and three or four hours later, we'd take them all home, and we'd do that every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. If we could get them on Saturday, we'd work with them on Saturday. If there's a quiz tournament, we went with them. And there was this one set of twins and their mom kind of came to church and their dad he was well, honestly he was an alcoholic and he, he dealt with drugs and they were divorced and he it was just an abusive situation and we had people th these girls that show up sometimes you'd pick them up and they'd be there and other days they wouldn't be there and they'd work and they had some potential so as a coach you're like yeah i'm working with them but really i had people that come to me and say why are you even wasting your time with these kids and i said well really i, I think i'm really trying to get the word of god in their heart 
And so somehow it's going to make a difference. And yet today I can show you a young lady that she's living for God and she's in love with God. And if, if you walk into Mercy Church, she's probably going to be the first person and she has this big smile on her face and she's, she's, she's bubbly and so bubbly you think, it's, is, is that even real? But she won't tell you that she went through a time when she fought major depression and that she, she was, you know, even medicated and she had to go through a bunch of stuff, but, but she got through all that. And she calls us her other parents. She calls, you're, you're just like family to me. Why? Because we did something that was good. And all we were really doing was saying, this is the most important thing, and we want you to love this more than anything else. And what we're doing, how we're showing you that is by the good deeds that we're doing and the time that we're investing in you. And we have you come over to the house, and we're just hanging out with you. Why are we doing that? Because it's important that you understand the most important thing is that soul that each and every one of us have. And so we just want to make a difference on souls. I'm talking today about the fruit of the Spirit. I really am. I haven't quite got there, but I'm, I'm getting there, I promise you. Colossians 1.10 says that you walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. I want God to be pleased with everything that I do. And this walk means that it's not just a walk, but it's my life. That's really what he's talking about. Being fruitful in every good work. You know, there's going to be that fruit if we don't faint. Okay, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's really what we're talking about tonight. Is that all right? Good verse, right? There's something that should set every Christian apart from others. We should be the different tree with a different kind of fruit. Is that all right? Okay? So when we walk out of here, we should look at ourselves as different. We should think of ourselves as different. We should expect to make a difference. And we don't blend with everybody else, but we have something that's better. We have something that's better. And that's something we have to understand because otherwise, when you're different, everyone else wants you to conform. If you don't think that what you have is better, you're going to accept what everybody else has. We need to understand that what we have is the best. So let's talk about that fruit. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 9 says, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. The fruit that I'm going to have is going to be good. It's going to be righteousness, which is living the right way that's pleasing to God, that reaps all the benefits of living for God, and it's going to be based on truth. The Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25, If we live in the Spirit, then we need to also walk in the Spirit. If we claim to have something, if we claim to be apostolic, if we claim that we've had this new birth experience, then it should make a difference in what we do and how we live. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say we reject all those works of the flesh because none of that is acceptable to what I really want to do. But now I really want to apply the fruit of the Spirit in my life. Now I know I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to, I honestly have a 10-week series covering the fruit of the Spirit. So we may end up at some time or another coming back on this. But let's just for a few minutes, the next few minutes, talk about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit refers to the attitudes of life and the thought patterns that become the characteristics of those who walk in the Spirit. It's our attitude, it's our thought pattern that's going to affect how we operate in this world. And so the fruit of the Spirit should be that guiding force within the life of each and every one of us. And that's going to make the difference if we really apply that. Now, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, there's this list. And we're going to cover this list, and I promise I'll be brief. I may just get into the definitional mode. I'll try to be brief. Sometimes I don't get too brief once I get up here, right? Love. Everybody knows what love is, right? Sort of. We kind of understand what love is, but really the only true definition of love is the love that God has shown to each and every one of us. And so really when we receive that Holy Ghost, and did you feel the love of God and it felt like nothing else that it ever, you'd ever felt before? That is love. And that's what we're supposed to have within us that we can then share with somebody else. It's not the love as defined by the world that's really selfishness that's masquerading as love. And it's, it may be lust or it, it may be just concerns as far as I, I feel good for you because I think that I can, we have something in common and there can be this relationship that we can build upon. That's not love. Love is what God did when he gave everything for us. And so if we're really going to love, then we're really going to give. And we're really going to understand that what he reached for was the value of a soul. And what we want to value is that same value of a soul. And why he loves me is because he died for me. It's because of that soul. And if he loves me that much, the only way that I can really learn to love others is if I can learn how much he loved me so that I can love myself. Because he said we need to love one another as he's loved us. And so until I really understand how he loves me, I can't really learn to love anybody else. But once I get that, then I have an obligation. Now I have to start practicing and doing the works and the words that's going to allow me 
to really let that spirit of God. And before I go any further, let me say all of this is one fruit of the spirit. And God expects all of this fruit to be in our lives. And we may say, well, I don't feel like this is the time for love because of all this stuff that I'm going through in my life. But God says, if, if, if there's no fruit, then I'm cutting off the branch. And I don't want to be that branch that gets cut off. So this fruit has to be in our life. And it doesn't matter what's going on in, in life. There's that purging pro process that's taking place. But God is still saying, this fruit has to be there. Okay? Is that all right? All right, so the fruit is going to be there. Love has to be there. True love always involves sacrificial giving. And I'm going to stop on love right there just because I could go all night on love and not even really touch on anything else, and we still would be here all night. Let's talk about joy. Everyone thinks they know about joy. And by the way, joy is something that we should have. If you have the fruit of the Spirit, it's not something that you have part-time. It's not something that you get on Sunday, Sunday after we've gone through three songs and you're getting all excited, and then you say, I feel a little bit of the joy of the Lord. And I like that song. I, I have the joy of the Lord. Uh, yeah. And what happens when you start singing that song? You start feeling the goodness and the power of that. But what is joy? Joy is something that's different from, from happiness. Happiness is conditional upon the situation. Joy is conditional upon the fact that I know that God loves me. He's already set everything up right for me. Even when I'm going through a situation and I don't understand, I can still trust him. It may be that mountain that we sang about. But right in the midst of all that mountain, I know that God's still here. And if he feels like this is what's best for me, then I can have joy because I know that he says it's going to be for good because I have that trust in him. I'm talking about the fruit of the spirit that it doesn't it's it's not predicated upon the situation. It's not predicated upon my 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 health or my wealth or or, or the blessings that God's given me. Joy is something that I have. And by the way, if we have joy, there should be something that it's pretty easy for us to smile most of the time. We should be happy people. We should be people that, that when others see it, there should be that fruit that they go, you know what, I think that that, that person, they're, they're, they aren't getting all stressed out, and they aren't filled with hatred, and they aren't filled with all these works of the flesh, variants, and, and all these other things. They really do have something that's different. And one of the best ways that we demonstrate that is through joy. And sometimes the enemy is going to say, you know what, you've been beaten up and you've gone through these trials and all these situations are here. And what, some of the best ways to get back at him is just begin to love God and just begin to say, God, I want a little bit more of that joy. And walk in this place da down a little bit, but just say, I'm going I'm to get my, my joy. And I'm going to get my peace and I'm going to get everything that God has. And I'm going to get filled up with that spirit. And you don't even have to walk in here. You can find that in your bedroom at home. You can find that going down the road. It's just a matter of you say, God, I need that spirit. And I want enough of that that I can make a difference in the life of somebody else. I'm talking about the fruit of the spirit. that has to be, It has to be in our life. It's not an option. Love, joy, what's the next one? Man, oh man. We live in a world that doesn't even know too much about peace, do they? But I am so glad that we can have the peace that passes understanding. I really am. There's something about, it's, it's more than a tranquility and a calmness, but it's, it's that knowing that all is well with my soul. And everything in life, you can be going through some situations today, and you can be saying, I don't even know what tomorrow's going to bring. But you can still say, in spite of all that, as long as I can connect with the Spirit of God and I abide in Him and His Spirit is abiding in me, and I don't know what tomorrow holds and today doesn't, feel like it's, everything's right, but I can still have peace, and I can still have joy, and I can still know that the love of God is present in my life. And so that ties into the next one, which is the word that we all love. Well, first of all, suffering is, is tough enough, right? But, you know, if there's going to be suffering, I, I'll, I'll pass if it's A, you get it, and B, you don't, then I'm lining up in the B, B line. But if I do have to have suffering, then I'm okay if you know, if, if it's a choice between short or long, if it's, a, if it's a, a headache for two hours or it's a major surgery and trying to recover for the next eight weeks, sign me up for the headache. Er, everybody with me? But what the fruit of the Spirit is going to be long-suffering. It's going to be the only way you, you, you demonstrate long-suffering is you have to suffer and you have to do it for a long time. I'm sorry, that's by definition, Right? So if we're going to have the fruit of the Spirit within our lives, there's going to be some things that are going to come in our lives as Christians, and it's going to be not what we want, and it's not going to be the way that we want it. But God is saying that's the fruit of the Spirit, and why would he do something like that? Because, one, it's, it, personally, it's, it's good for us. 
but because it shapes us and it molds us and it makes us gentle and it makes us compassionate on others and it makes us understand things that otherwise we wouldn't understand. But in addition to that, you want to see a demonstrate. If, if everything's going great with somebody, I'm not so impressed with whatever's going on in their life. But if I see somebody that they're, they're going through that tough time and it just seems like it's all dark and no day, and yet they smile, and yet they have joy, and yet they have love, and yet they have peace, and yet they have patience, what does that do? That says there's somebody that's different. That they're not like everybody else. So I said originally we were witnesses because of the spirit that was within us. That's some of the greatest opportunities for us to be a witness. So what we need to say is, okay, God, I'm going through this period of long suffering, and I don't understand anything about it, but I want you to get all the glory. And so I'm going to make sure that I stay attached to you. And I'm going to make sure that if, if you think that I'm, I'm good enough that you want me to get through this, then we're going to get through this together. And so it's all going to be okay in the end. So I'm going to go through this, but I'm going to go through this with love and with joy and with peace being evident and being radiant within my life. And along with that long suffering, as I already told you, you're going to find out there's going to be some gentleness that begins to come into you, into your life. You know, sometimes those things kind of gentle us. Sometimes those things kind of help us to understand that we're not, if, if everything is easy, sometimes we don't understand the suffering that somebody else goes through. Some of the things that really mold us the most is some of that long suffering. And so then we can have that gentleness, that kindness, that inoffensive, kindly disposition, that polite friendliness and courtesy that makes it easy for somebody to approach you. I want to be the type of person that, one, they know they can come to me and they can talk to me, but they know that there's going to be a gentleness and that I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be representing the spirit of God because, as I said, God is saying, I, 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 I don't like the sin, but, oh, I love the sinner and I want the sinner to repent. And, I want this, and so it, no matter what your problem is and no matter what your situation is, I want to be approachable and I want to be that gentle spirit that you know you can trust. And, and does anybody else feel the same way? If you're a parent, do you want your kids to feel that way about you? Yeah. It's important, isn't it? It really is. Gentleness. Goodness. Now, we all know what good is, right? I'm good. I'm good. We hear it all day long, don't we? Are people really good? Goodness is in the heart of a spirit-filled person. It's that desire that grows to be good and to help the bodies and souls of other people. Now, that's a little different from what the world thinks of as far as being good. And Jesus actually said when they, they called him good, he said, there's only one good, that's God. And so that goodness that we have actually has to come from God when we realize that I can be kind and I can be gentle and there can be within me that inoffensive disposition that's just going to reach out to somebody else and say, how can I help you? And how can I do good for you? Because goodness is going to be demonstrated in what I say and in what I do. And then, of course, the one that we all know, faith, right? We all know what faith is, right? That's what happens when you get healed. That's what happens when you receive the Holy Ghost. That's a part of believing, right? Well, faith is actually a part of walking. and Faith is actually a part of everything that we do because it's this absolute trust in God. If you go and you study Hebrews chapter 11, which is called the, the faith, what do they call it? All the heroes of faith are listed there. What you're going to find is that all they did, Abram, what did he do? He walked with God everywhere that God told him to walk. And all he did was wait for like 25 years to actually have a son. And in the meantime, everything that he did was he was doing in a way that was pleasing to God. He was building altars and he was offering sacrifices. And, and God was promising him it again. And then 12 years later, he'd get around to doing something else. He had to be full of faith. And that's where we get the word of faithful. So if the fruit of the Spirit is going to be evident in our life, then we're going to be faithful. We're going to be faithful to the house of God. We're going to be faithful to the things of God. We're going to be faithful to the word of God. We're going to be faithful to prayer. We're going to be faithful to God. We're going to be faithful to each other. Because faith is going to be demonstrated by faithfulness. And the fruit of the Spirit is going to be evident in us because of our faithfulness. I think we're on the last one. Nope, two more. Meekness. Meekness, now, this is a word that everybody thinks it means that you're mealy-mouthed, and, and this is what a lot of people think of with Christians because they think of the meek and those that aren't really going to do anything. Well, uh, uh, actual definition of meekness is eyes straight ahead. Now, Brother Williams, you were in the military, so you understand that you were supposed to look straight ahead, and when you, you were doing so, you didn't look down and you didn't look up. Well, eyes straight ahead, meekness really means that I understand the value of a soul so much that I look everybody in the eye. I don't look up to somebody and think that they're better than me. 
I'm not intimidated by anybody. It doesn't matter if they're the governor or the president or, or a boss or anything else. And yet at the same time, I don't look at anybody as being less than me. Meekness says everybody is somebody that I love and that I value and that I have that same ap appreciation for. We're all equals. We're all children of God. And so meekness ties that into where I understand that I can be meek with everybody. And because of that, then I'm not going to be intimidated by others, but at the same time, I'm not going to look down on anybody else either. There's going to be that gentleness and that humility. And so this is going to be the opposite of pride that's going to be within the lives of each and every one of us. It's not weakness. It's actually strength, but it's strength that's controlled. Because it's, it's understanding that God is with me, and therefore I don't have to be intimidated by anybody. But yet there's that desire to reach out to everybody. And that's meekness. That's really meekness. Aristotle described meekness as that middle position between excessive anger and excessive lack of spirit. He's saying it's where you have everything controlled enough to where you don't get caught up too far one way or another. But it's really that middle ground of saying, I can walk right here in the middle and I can be comfortable. I, could, I can be in a place that's so full of suits and fancy people with all kinds of money. And I can be comfortable because my father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Or I can sit down and, and w I can be with people that are struggling just to make ends meet. And I can be comfortable with them because my God loves them. And they each have a soul that's of equal value. And that's meekness. A little different than uh, it's taught a lot of times. And like I said, I got a whole lesson I can teach on that one. And then we're now to temperance, which many times we describe as self-control. But we're already talking about the fruit of the spirit. Temperance, which if you think of temperance, you're thinking of the days of prohibition. And they called it temperance because, you know, they weren't drinking alcohol. And therefore, they had that control over their spirits as well as the spirits that were intoxicating spirits. So we understand that as far as being sober and temperate, calm and dispassionate. It's that dispassionate approach to life. You master the personal desires and the personal passions. But really temperance, if it's going to be the fruit of the spirit, isn't self-control. We've already talked about the body, soul, and the spirit. And how that the soul has the mind, and that's what really wants the mind tries to control everything, but if we're really going to be spirit-filled and have the fruit of the spirit, our spirit is going to be controlling our mind and our flesh, and our spirit is going to be being led by his spirit. And so that really is the temperance that we want within our life. Yes, it's controlled, but it's controlled by his spirit as our spirit uh, is obedient to that. And we can only do that as we are in abiding in him and he is abiding within us. We can only do all of this through the power of the Holy Ghost. It's the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of our efforts. But really, it's just saying, God, I just want to be connected to you. And not only that, but realizing that if I can ever get this fruit, and if it can really be free-flowing within me, then I can make a difference in the life of somebody else. And I can reach somebody else. And that's really my desire, and I hope that's your desire as well tonight. Stand with me, if you will. So everybody wants to define what a Christian is. If we were to go on trial today, I wonder, would there be enough evidence to convict us based upon the word of God that we're really Christians? What type of fruit do we really have? What would my family testify? What would my friends and my coworkers say? What type of fruit is there really in my life? Am I somebody that's just blending? Am I somebody that really the works of the flesh and that anger and that frustration is coming out more than it should? Because really, this is really the way we're supposed to live. God's good, isn't he? I believe that we can do it, not by ourselves, but because of his spirit. And I just want to abide more and more in him because I want to be able to make a difference with in the life of somebody else. And more than anything else, I want to make heaven my home. How about you? Fruit of the Spirit. God, let's...